Welcome in, everyone, and thank you for listening to the 137th ever episode of the Missouri Sports Podcast, brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the Rebel Advertising Studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? I'm great, Cameron. How are you? You always just throw it back to me immediately nowadays. You, there's, well, <laughs> you seem to be more of a... I gotta know how you're doing. I gotta... What's... Don't I have the right to know how you're doing too? Yeah, of course. Okay, well, how are you? I'm doing well. What would you prefer me to do? Like go on a because rant about something? You used yeah. to have like a because. Yeah. Oh, okay, you well. Say why you're great. Oh, okay. Well, I'm. You, you just need to, how are you doing today? Be like, why are you great today, Kyle? That would really throw me for a loop. <laughs> uh, Producer Cameron, um, I do have a question for you as oh, a Denver no. Broncos fan. Uh, I've been noticing some interesting social media behavior from the Denver Broncos account where they – is Justin Fields running the Denver Broncos Twitter, I guess, is my question, because <laughs> anything that has to do with Justin Fields, they're, like, tweeting about, doing, like, eyes emojis towards – like, they're really disrespecting my boy Drew Locke, wherever he is right here. Yeah. They're it's kind okay. of – they're uh, like, in all seriousness, I think it's, I think it's weird, like, that they – are like drawing like, attention to like tweet links to mock drafts that have them taking a quarterback yeah they're like mm. they, they had us taking justin fields here and they're like excited about it yeah and i'm like you guys have a quarterback but i i mean i know that drew lock may not be the guy of the future but it is just a little weird to me do you have a response um well i don't really get on twitter hardly ever so i wasn't really aware of this yes i do think it's weird and I would love for Drew Locke to be the franchise quarterback. But also, probably whoever's running the account probably has no idea who they're drafting. Yeah. They might just be someone who's excited to potentially get a quarterback. I, it's yeah. so egregious that I almost wonder if someone instructed the social media person to do that for, like, a smokescreen. Smokescreen. Because mm-hmm. they have, yeah, dr- yeah. they have tr- like, aligned themselves with Justin Fields so much <laughs> on Twitter that I'm like, okay, they're never drafting Justin Fields. Like, it's a smokescreen. I'm all over it. And if they draft Justin Fields in, I look like an idiot, and Drew Locke is going to be on but a new team. it's just a reverse smokescreen. <laughs> They've go. got all the teams thinking it's a smokescreen. Which and then is they, infinitely cooler. And then they reverse it on them. Wow. That's what I think maybe is going to happen. Maybe the smokescreen is having Peyton Manning work with Drew Locke. Who knows? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> They're just putting everything out there. <laughs> you never know. Well, Kyle, the uh, transfer news and everything finally – slowed down a little bit the the waiver wire has cooled off that's what i'm calling it now the transfer portal is now the waiver wire um we do have a little bit of news but we finally uh have a minute here to actually recap this most recent mizzou basketball season uh we've been waiting to do that waiting for a little bit of slowdown in the in the roster action so we've hit that point where we can and we've had a little bit of time post the season ending to kind of reflect a little bit and really take stock of the season that just happened. Before we get to that though, let me remind everyone to go subscribe to our YouTube channel. A little uptick in subscribers recently. Love that. Um, don't forget to like the video. Leave us a comment if you'd like. Um, I actually have a few. Well, let me say that. Let me get through this little intro first. Um, leave us a review on the podcast service you use to listen to us that's all very much appreciated and as always if you want to support the podcast you can do so at patreon.com slash missouri sports pod um now kyle i want to read a few youtube comments from our last video and kind of get your your reaction to them obviously last episode we talked about the incoming transfers and what we thought they might bring to the mizzou roster next year and we did get some feedback. We have a comment here from J Rob on YouTube. He says, knowing that these guys have some years to play and the numbers they produced at their old schools is exciting. I'm really excited about Coleman. His highlights at Ball State are impressive. I think that was right in line with what we were saying on the episode. And he's definitely the most exciting player of that uh, threesome of transfers to uh, at least from what i've seen i agree um i'm not i don't know that coleman will be the leading scorer out of those three guys but i think he's the most intriguing i think he brings something to the table that we that we don't have 
And J Rob is right on the money talking about how the fact that these guys all have three years to play is exciting. And then I've got two comments here from the magic man, magic with a J. Um, and to your point about maybe Coleman not being the highest scorer, uh, he says Amari Davis will end up being the better scorer of the three new transfers. I really hate predicting how good players will be after predicting that Santos, a player with that we got from Juco a couple years ago, uh, that he would be a stud after seeing his highlights. <laughs> and yeah, so that's an interesting point. Uh, yeah, Santos is still to this day one of the greatest mysteries of planet Earth. Uh, wh- I I don't know what happened to Santos. I don't know if he just didn't want to work as hard anymore. I he, I don't know if he never maybe he never could get back healthy from his injuries. I don't but know. yeah, that was a weird case, and I, I replied and said that Santos is puzzling to this day. Yeah, I, I, um, w- what did he say? What was the first part of that? That Amari Davis would be the better scorer oh. of the three new transfers. Yeah, I mean, um, he doesn't necessarily, which I, I think this kept him from blowing up very much. Uh, whenever he announced his transfer, I think Missouri was his only Power Five offer. Uh, after just this this round of, of transfers, but. Yeah, I think that his game, his style of game kept him from blowing up a little bit, but he's been able to score wherever he's been in high school um, at Wisconsin Green Bay. He, he, he just knows how to put the ball in the hoop. So I'm kind of excited to see what he's going to do. I mean, 17 points per game where he's coming from at any level, that's really impressive to be able to score uh, that much on a consistent level. So I, I agree. I think that he may be our leading scorer next year. And then the Magic Man also said Boogie Coleman is the same type of player as Drew Smith, except a little more athletic. That's a that's a pretty high bar. That's a high bar. But if you're talking about a do it all guard, um, it, I don't know, maybe big shoes to fill defensively. Yeah. Uh, with Drew Smith, and uh, I think Drew potentially underrated as a distributor as well. But uh, yeah, based on um, Coleman's highlight tapes he really does look like he can do it all in a similar way to drew smith has a chance to be had to have that kind of usage that's yeah. for sure yeah i'll be interested to see if he i don't see any player on missouri's roster next season being first team all sec defense or let alone first team overall I agree. like drew smith was but maybe by the time they're seniors all right yeah thanks for the comments guys keep yes. them coming yes um let's do a little bit of news here um we'll start off with some football news haven't talked football in a while uh the missouri tigers got a commitment from a missouri native tristan wilson from lebanon an offensive lineman yeah tristan wilson was a guy that had missouri had been kind of trending with recently but he really kind of started to blow up a little bit in recruiting uh he has 12 power five offers including one from a school called alabama uh so anytime you can They're a basketball school that's true <laughs> anytime you can uh keep a guy in state that has offers to really go anywhere that's huge and that's something that missouri has not been able to do um before coach Drinkwitz. so uh i i love uh big offensive lineman he's, he's six five he i mean he's got a chance to be good right away so uh, it's taken some time. I think whenever Barry Odom left, uh, the cupboard was very bare and a few areas and offensive line was one of those. And so, uh, coaches is, is, uh, building that back up, which we, we need very bad. <laughs> Barry left the cupboard bare. That's true. Yeah. Do you know the, uh, there's only one other Mizzou offensive lineman that's ever played from Lebanon. Do you know who it, the other one was? Yeah. Dang it. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot big yeah. time here. The listeners are going to know before me. Probably. That is probably true, but um, that's okay. He was a member of the 2013 team. Correct. And it was one of three players that I can think of. That's that's not wrong. <laughs> it was Justin Britt. Okay. From, he, he was the one that I wouldn't have got. He's so. from Lebanon, and then he went on to have a, a nice NFL career uh, with the Seahawks, and I think he's still playing now, but with a different team. I don't remember off the top of my head. I was thinking, I was like, I know it wasn't Mitch Morse. It wasn't Evan Bame. It was the other really good offensive lineman. I couldn't couldn't get there. Man, that offensive line was gnarly. Yeah. 
All right, so basketball news. Uh, we knew that there were some Missouri Tigers in the transfer portal. We didn't know last week where they were going to end up, but now we know that Xavier Pinson is headed to LSU of all places. Oh, man. Know your worth, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, What's he worth to Will Wade, I wonder? Yeah, that would be interesting. If you like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't Anything else too, to add? I don't want to be too accusatory. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this was a weird, weird one. Um, uh, he named a top four and then uh, a few days later named a top two and the top two were not in the top four. And, and one of them was Kansas. One of them was Kansas, of course. So, ah, uh, man, I don't want to like rip the guy on the way out, but it's just so weird. And yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I don't want to like try and decipher too much from no. from this, but I just sometimes you just have to wonder like what his his time at Mizzou was like behind the scenes, and uh, there's so much going into all this that we will yeah. never know. Yeah, there's 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 two sides to a story, and we know a little bit about one side, but we'll never know what really happened. Yeah, or even just like what like you know of those top four that ended up being a top six, basically what were those coaches saying you know how were they pitching him with a role and you know because there were some teams in his top four that just like in the next three days after he posted that just like added like arkansas added like multiple guards like in the next three days yeah uh i really did not want him to go to arkansas i'm gonna be no. honest but i mean, I mean we're, lsu is we're gonna have just to as bad play him anyway it again this is uh speculation on my part but it just really felt like he aggressively wanted to go somewhere where he could play missouri yeah. next year i was really hoping he'd go to nebraska <laughs> yeah i know like the only team mentioned that wasn't just on Missouri's get out schedule. Of here. and because i i understand why you wouldn't as a coach maybe you wouldn't want a guy like that on your team because the the ceiling's high but the consistency was all over the place and we're going to talk about that probably a lot in this episode mm. but uh i'll he i mean at the same time, though, half the time he was carrying us to victories. So I know he has that potential, especially in an offense like LSU. He could he could drop 30 against anybody. Well, I mean, yeah, when I looked at his little list there, it was like when now looking at all the teams that were mentioned with him, LSU, Arkansas, and Auburn, I was just like, no, that would be a disaster <laughs> for any – for like Missouri having to play those teams potentially next year. That would be, and and he technically has two years of eligibility left, so we may see him multiple times uh, down the line. But I was just thinking that the offenses involved of the SEC teams and Georgia too, with Tom Crean, it seemed like he he's obviously had success with guards over the past few seasons at, um, at Georgia. So I, I didn't really like any of those spots for Penson as far as being a future opponent for Missouri. Obviously I wish him success. I hope he can tear it up and, um, you know, maybe get drafted in the NBA, but when Missouri plays LSU, I hope they shut him down. He's going to be motivated. Yeah. Uh, another former tiger, uh, Torrance Watson announced he is going to attend Elon and I don't know much about Elon. I thought you were going to make an Elon Musk joke. <laughs> Elon Musk <laughs> <did> University. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, Torrance is a guy that I really uh, was rooting for and was really hoping things would work out for him at Mizzou, and that just never quite seemed to happen. And uh, But we, we know he has the ability to score. I mean, he's got that, that pure jumper, and uh, he's athletic, um, but... More importantly, I think he's just a really good guy, so I wish, wish him the best for sure. Yeah, Elon is a member of the Colonial Athletic Association, and they were 10th out of 10 in offensive efficiency this past season, so they were probably looking to upgrade their firepower a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, he's the kind of guy where, I mean – if he's guarding maybe a little bit lower level player and he's not he doesn't have a defensive minded coach maybe <laughs> he and they let him play 30 minutes a game i mean he could easily score 10 15 points a game if yeah. he well, I if think, he really wanted to i think to. that's absolutely what's going to happen yeah i think they'll just kind of let him loose and he'll be going up against a slightly lower caliber defender yep and i could see him really making an impact on the offensive end mm mm-hmm. mhm 
All right. And then the last bit of news I have is that uh, some of this has been confirmed. Some of this was just said by Conzo in a recent interview. Um, Drew Smith, Mitchell Smith, and Jeremiah Tillman have all signed or are planning to sign with agents and pursue a pro career. So um, unlike Drew Buggs, who entered the transfer portal, and Mark Smith, who ended up at Kansas State, uh, those three will not be playing college basketball again. Yeah, I think we knew that for sure, but it's just confirmation that those guys are moving on. Uh, also, Parker Brown to Santa Clara. Yep. So that thank you should be an interesting. Uh, that'd be a nice place to live for a little while. I would say so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't. Yeah, spending a couple years at college there uh, doesn't sound too bad. All right, so now we are recapping the 2020 slash 2021 Mizzou college basketball season. And it was a roller coaster. Um, I went back actually, so to like preface this conversation, I went back and listened to our season preview episode, which unfortunately we had to do over Zoom because we had COVID at the time, or we had recently had COVID and we're quarantining. So um, I listened to that episode and I think a lot of our takes were very accurate when you look at the season as a whole, especially with the way Missouri ended the season. Um, We looked like we were going to be dead wrong about Missouri's outlook, you know, around the beginning of February when they were ranked 10th in the country and the um, NCAA tournament preview show had them as a four seed. It looked like we were going to be dead wrong, but then they kind of uh, regressed to the mean a little bit for the talent level of the players on the team and ended up being really close to kind of what we predicted. Um, it was interesting seeing the state of the schedule preseason and how it fluctuated throughout the season. So when we were picking the games preseason, there was no Oregon game scheduled. And then obviously in SEC play, we lost the opportunity of playing Texas A&M and Vanderbilt at home, almost uh, LSU as well. So the records that we predicted were a little bit off from the math doesn't add up with the final record because there was games added and games taken away. They also didn't play Prairie View A&M, which would have been pretty much a guaranteed win. But I had them finishing the season at 13 and 11, nine and nine in SEC play. You predicted 14 and 10, nine and nine in SEC play. They finished the season 15 and eight, eight and eight, in sec play yeah if we would have had those three games at home probably all three wins that what like 18 and 8 looks a heck of a lot better than 15 and 8 yeah and the season probably 10 and 8 in conference looks a lot better than 8 and 8 yeah and and nothing really ultimately changes about the season that much with those outcomes but in our minds it probably just looks better yeah i mean does that change our ncaa tournament seeding very much it very well could could make us an eight instead of a nine so if we which lo- if we lose to oklahoma as the eight and oklahoma's the nine after winning 18 games in the regular season we're not feeling that much different about you know how the season ends up i mean even we maybe are more disappointed that they won that many games and still were bounced as a eight yeah. seed but uh yeah so basically I don't know this it's just so weird how they were like two different seasons basically the non-conference and then conference play all the way through the alabama game missouri looked like one of the better teams in the country they looked like they could go out and beat anybody any night uh, they had only dropped games to tennessee and mississippi state and auburn at that time uh, two of those on the road so everything was looking pretty good after the Alabama game Missouri was sitting at 13 and three six and three in conference and I mean that was like I said right when the tournament preview came out had him as a four seed so things were looking fantastic at that point and kind of blowing everybody's expectations away um how do you feel I don't know like are you able to call the season a success big picture with the outcome we had obviously comparing it to our preseason expectations obviously yes we can 
but knowing where we were sitting at 10th in the AP poll coming off the big win over Alabama, are you still calling it a success knowing where we were mid season? That's a tough question. And I've thought, I've thought about that a lot. Um, I'd still say yes, just because just knowing our preseason expectations and what we thought this team was going to do, I think we still had enough en- enough situations where they just completely blew the doors off of what we thought they could do. I think there was enough of those moments where enough big wins, um, a top 10 ranking, like even though they finished pretty disappointing in a disappointing way, I still think they accomplished enough in the season where they surpassed what we thought we, they could do. It was still a better season than Missouri's had historically in the last like 10 years, which is kind of crazy to say, but, uh, and they made the NCAA tournament. And I think that we need to be realistic about what to expect from Missouri basketball teams. And honestly, if you look at historically, if you, if you want to say historically in the last decade, it's not a given that Missouri makes the NCAA tournament. And I know we went through the commanders and era, but it, it still happened. Mm. And so uh, we made the NCAA tournament. We had a good season for the most part. I, I would, I would call it, I would call it a success. Okay, I'll just put you down for settling for mediocrity. Um, I am a real Mizzou fan, and I am very disappointed with this season. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. You better be careful. I'm settling for mediocrity as well. Um, and I think if you get to the NCAA tournament, you never know what can happen once you get there. And we see it every year. I mean, it doesn't matter if your team, I mean, Mizzou fans know, it doesn't matter if your team is a two seed in the tournament. There's no guarantees once that tournament begins. And Virginia fans know it doesn't matter if you're a one seed. There's no guarantees. So just getting to the tournament, I think, has to be the goal every single season. And yes, the back half of conference play was disappointing. And But I think we knew that something had to give I mean, I I feel like maybe just on this podcast, maybe I'm not taking the temperature of the Mizzou fandom as a whole very well, but I feel like mid-season, we were still a little bit... We knew that Missouri didn't have the shooting to get it done, (laughs) and the defense was becoming suspect at (laughs) times. And, you know, every time that the um, offensive efficiency got better and the defensive efficiency slipped, that just, you couldn't sustain that for very long. That That's a great point. There really was an element of like, how are we doing this? Yeah. Like in kind of mid season, whenever we were beating some of these top 10 teams, we'd be uh, number six, Tennessee on the road. Yeah. Like what, how did that happen? Yeah. Um, I, Tennessee did kind of have a, a little bit of a collapse of their own. That's that true. They turned around late, but yeah, Missouri just peaked at the wrong time and it helped that some of their opponents had down weeks. But, like, the thing that stands out to me is that overtime win against TCU where Missouri's defense was atrocious. And I think that was kind of a clue that things weren't perfect. But then it was immediately covered up by the back-to-back wins over Kentucky and Alabama. So that was kind of forgotten about and kind of swept under the rug. Like, oh, that TCU game was just, you know, that was just a weird um, outlier. But then with the way the season ended, I don't think that was actually the case. I do think that this season potentially looks a little bit different if uh, we hold on to that game against Arkansas at home, if we have Jeremiah Tillman, or even if we don't have him, if we just find a way to win that game. One that went into overtime. Yeah. I think that I think that one outcome could have changed the season outlook a little bit. I think that uh, obviously Arkansas ended up being – a top 10 team in the country by the end of the season. Um, I don't know. I think that could have really helped our draft, our, our draft seed, <laughs> our NCAA uh, tournament seed a little bit. Um, I, it, that's just how small of a margin that there is on in a season where like, just if you change the outcome, good or bad, just on a couple of these games, it can really change things dramatically. I got ahead of myself a little bit and kind of glossed over the non-conference season. Um, I think that was actually the point, like after the Illinois game, that was the point where I had the most optimism on the season because they really hadn't shown, I mean, only a nine point win over Liberty, but Liberty was just kind of that pesky, annoying style of play. But um, 
the games against Oregon and Wichita State and then Illinois um, were really just fantastic. And so, and blowing out Sweet Sixteen Oral Roberts. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't forget that one. Um, that the non-conference season was surprising, yeah. and to be undefeated, and then they, they well, they did squeak out the last one against Bradley with that, and that was kind of a, a little bit of a red flag. But yeah. and Bradley ended up being a lot worse than we thought they were going to be. But up to that point, there was a lot more optimism, I think, and I, I wasn't feeling. I was actually feeling like, okay, the offense has figured something out. I wasn't feeling like this isn't sustainable. Once we got into conference play and the offense kind of came back down to earth a little bit, I think that's when I started to see, okay, these are the same guys that we knew we had. Well, in that non-conference, it felt like we were really, really taking advantage of transition buckets. And, uh, man, uh, Xavier Pinson was was pushing the ball. Um, We were still at times struggling in the half court which never changed throughout the season but I really felt like we just kind of came out and surprised people with how quickly we wanted to get the ball back in play and just be running the other way with it and it took a few games I think for uh for teams to figure out that that's what we wanted to do now because it's not what a Conzo Martin team has done historically so uh, I think once teams figured out that we wanted to push the ball in transition like ultra fast Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that really hurt us quite a bit because I, I just think we were we were taking advantage so much of that and scoring so many points a game off of that. And when Xavier Pinson didn't have that to resort to, when teams kind of started cracking down on that, I think that hurt his game a lot. I think teams kind of figured out what he wanted to do. And once he had the target on his back, I think you, you could tell that was uh, hurting his game quite a bit. And another thing that happened is opponents became confident that Missouri would not make outside shots. And so yeah. uh, that Thanks was Tennessee for showing that blueprint. Yeah. So that was, and then that became so obvious, like the back half of conference play Yeah. where teams were just like, fine, shoot all the jumpers you want, shoot all the three pointers you want. All we're going to do is make sure that Tillman can't do anything down low and we're going to cut off all driving lanes. You're going to drive from the top of the key to the free throw line. You're going to have to kick it back out and people are going to be open, but but defenses were saying yeah we'll take that chance every single time and uh really the only it feels like the only player down the stretch that could do much in the paint Tillman still had some decent games but Kobe Brown was like one of the only players that it seemed like he was just like outworking opponents to manufacture something on offense Mm -hmm. so we'll switch gears here and talk about the players more specifically um maybe we'll talk about the seniors here uh Drew Smith Jeremiah Tillman Mark Smith, Mitchell Smith, and Drew Bugs. Um, Drew Smith again was the MVP of the season. Um, he was pretty much what we wanted him to be, and uh, actually ended up being Missouri's best three-point shooter at just under forty percent, thirty-nine point eight percent from three on one hundred and eighteen attempts. He pretty much became Missouri's only reliable three-point shooter yeah uh and i love watching drew drew smith play um at his time at mizzou and i tend to uh have this thing where i kind of romanticize and romanticize things when i look look back on on things a few years down the road but i'm already doing that with drew smith a little bit uh and when i i think when we look back on the season i almost think we're gonna wish that he uh shot more I was a little more I shouldn't say was a little more aggressive because it's not that he didn't play hard but I wish that he would have forced the issue a little bit more with his own individual scoring I think he specifically shot I wish he would have shot more I wish he would have I don't know I drive more to the basket I wish I think there was more in the tank as far as scoring goes with Drew Smith I think that he could have still been efficient if he forced the issue a little bit more individually and I think that we'll look back and wish that we had that next gear from Drew Smith that we never quite saw uh, scoring wise. It's uh, one of the things that we talked about in the season preview was that we didn't want Drew Smith to have to be relied on as a scorer. And I think that still holds true, but now, so, so I, that's why I can't blame the team or the staff or anything for not having him force the issue more from a scoring standpoint, because really 
the way this team, the makeup of this team is not for him to be your leading scorer. But two years in a row, he's your leading scorer. This team is set up for either Mark Smith or Xavier Pinson to be your leading scorer. And Mark Smith just couldn't get the three-point shot going. Xavier Pinson was too inconsistent. Neither one of them stepped into that role. So I can't blame the staff or Drew for not either one for that not being the case that he like took over the offense but looking back on it that's obviously what needed to happen and it was just too late I think in the season by the time that was kind of figured out and he got a shot going from outside and it was just too late and I don't know I I don't think they could retool the offense on the fly to get him you know seven three-point looks per game what's one Drew Smith uh, moment you think you'll remember for a long time Honestly, the end of the Oklahoma game in the NCAA tournament where I where he almost just like won us the game and yeah. he like kind of put the team on his back and made that huge three. And that, I mean, that's the one that sticks out immediately that in wondering what would have happened if he could have got a look and got a shot off there the second time. Um, yeah, that's the Honestly, one that first comes to mind. I had kind of put that memory behind me a little bit and i kind of forgot about that and until you just said that i hadn't thought about that really until maybe like 24 hours after the game happened but you're right i mean and the fact that that's his last game in a mizzou uniform and he really pulled out all the stops and he just decided i'm gonna take these shots well i think that's what made me think of it at the time was what i just said i wish we would have seen him force the issue a little bit more because he did and the good things happened right there at the end of the oklahoma game it was like he was finally like reached that point where he was like oh my god my career is about to end if I don't yeah. do something. And I wish that maybe he had that sense of urgency a little bit more earlier in the season. But, uh, not, I mean, not to criticize him whatsoever. No. I mean, but that's a that's a good point. He really did uh, – man, he was the only reason we had a shot at the yeah. end of that game. Uh, I'd probably just say the Florida game where he hit the game-winning layup oh, yeah, at absolutely. the buzzer. Yeah. Yeah, two good moments right there at the end of the season. They're definitely super memorable. Uh, the one against Florida will be on like Mizzou highlight reels forever at this yeah. point. Um, okay, moving on to Jeremiah Tillman. Um, I w- what we said about him in the season preview was that we just had to see more consistency, and we talked about the fact that the um, the times that he's shown what he like his potential, the times that he's shown his ceiling, have been there since day one. And I even mentioned the um, showdown for relief game against Kansas where he had some just incredible plays where he did not look like he was a high school senior before his first college season. He looked like a seasoned college player. And we saw those flashes his sophomore year, his junior year. He had some injuries. He obviously dealt with foul trouble. That was the biggest part of his first three seasons, I'd say. I do think he finally got it figured out um, as far as being able to stay on the floor. He rebounded the ball pretty well his senior season, um, scored 12 points per game, averaged 7.3 rebounds per game. Um, I really think he figured it out maybe 85% of what I would have hoped for his senior season. Yeah, I, I would say he had a better season than I would have predicted for him preseason. And be, because he, he found consistency, he found a way to stay on the floor, he was consistently a threat on offense. And in fact, I mean, they really tried to run the offense through through him quite a bit. And, you know, sometimes I'm not sure that that was always the best thing to give him the ball out on the perimeter sometimes and let him go to work. But uh, for the most part, though, he, he looked a lot more confident he was by far the most improved player on the team from like last season to this season. He was kind of the the X factor as far as like why is Missouri this much better? And I thought and I feel like a lot of that was because Jeremiah Tillman was a lot better, and uh, we really needed him to be the player he was. The thing that hurt th- hurt him the most was Missouri not being able to knock out knock down shots from the outside. For sure, if there's some three point shooting consistently, that opens everything up for him to operate. And I think the first half of the season. He had a little bit more of that and was able to make things happen, pass out of double teams. But when teams don't care if you pass out of the double team to a wide open shooter, then what are you supposed to do? They're just going to throw everybody at you. And how many times did we see an entry pass to Tillman where four opponent defenders had a foot in the lane? Yeah. 
sometimes five. Every head was turned looking at him. They could almost disregard the player that they were guarding unless it was basically Drew Smith or Xavier Pinson. Yep, that's a good point. Um, so we talked a bit about Mark Smith. Um, Mark, unfortunately, just never got the three-point shot going. And we talked in the preview about how he would go off against uh, worse teams. And once, sometimes when a Mizzou game was already in hand, he would score some garbage time buckets and inflate his stats a little bit. Um, when I look at just like a summary of the player stats, seeing him below 10 points per game, that just kind of like screams to me the biggest missing piece of the offense where he needs to be either he needs to be up around 12, 13 points per game or Pinson would need to be up around like 15, 16 points per game. Yeah, I agree. He was probably the most disappointing piece of of the starters. And just because he was so limited in the way where like, yeah, at times if, if we didn't play, if we were playing a defense that wasn't very good, then he could be a good spot up shooter. But uh, from a season long standpoint, that's all he could do was shoot right off the catch and he couldn't create his own shot. He couldn't drive to the basket usually and make something happen. He was turnover prone. He wasn't a great ball handler. Uh, I felt like his defense maybe took a dive a little bit um, in the second half of the season comparatively to what he was his whole Mizzou career for whatever reason. But yeah, he just, um, he just wasn't uh, uh, consistent enough in the, sh- in shooting to, cause that was really what he was on the floor to do considering he didn't really offer much else and, uh, and just couldn't quite get it done enough. Yeah. Finished the season shooting 31 and a half percent from three. Uh, He finished his junior season shooting 37% from three. And holy cow, would I have loved to have seen 37% from three from him this year. That would have literally changed the outcome of a couple games if he's shooting like that. And on 127 attempts, you got to have more than 32%. I feel like the reason why he, I heard, I, I feel like I've heard this. The reason why he transferred from Illinois to Mizzou is because he wanted to play point and that didn't happen when he got to Mizzou. And maybe he's thinking he's going to play point at Kansas state. I have a hard time seeing that happen. I just can't imagine Mark Smith playing point guard, uh, at the division one college level. I just, I can't imagine that. Um, it just seemed like he had butterfingers a little too, a little mu- too much and would kind of fumble the ball around and was not confident driving. Yeah. And, it, and he wasn't the type of player that would find the open man much either. I yeah. mean, he had, the lowest assist rate on the team so if he was if he if creating for other players is kind of a part of his toolkit he never really showed it at missouri yeah and and i mean it just it's so easy to be negative on him he seemed like a really great teammate and was always like getting hyped for big moments and cheering the teammates on but from a pure production standpoint i think uh, he was easily the most disappointing player this past season. Um, a player who had his up and ups and downs throughout the season is the last, oh, second to last senior. We're going to talk about Mitchell Smith. He averaged four and a half points per game, five rebounds, and just under one assist. And what's not on the stat sheet is the pretty excellent defense he played all season long. And he had some huge moments uh, this season. He, he's kind of like, I feel like in my mind, when I think about Mitchell Smith, I'm just going to think about these like big moments in big games where he would just make a play and he would like get so excited about it mm-hmm. afterwards. Yeah. And it was just always fun to watch. And I'm also going to always remember being not thrilled when he would take a three point shot. <laughs> yeah. When you and all of Twitter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Miss Smith was definitely, um, he was that guy that made the team better, but never really got any credit for anything. And cause he didn't really score. He didn't really, he didn't really do a lot that sh- showed up in the stat sheet, but, um, yeah, he played good defense, good, uh, d- decent rebounder. He was really pretty mobile for how tall he is. Um, he would switch onto guards and 
hold his own right on perimeter. I think that's what made him so good defensively is because he was so versatile and, and really could guard one through five almost at times he could really he could really guard anybody you you needed him to at least temporarily so uh yeah I think we'll miss him in like in ways that we're not really thinking about um but he did have that huge block to save the game against Alabama you yeah. could probably make the argument that he fouled the guy but we're uh doesn't matter i'll argue with you if you say that <laughs> we're we're walking out of there with a dub because of the, because of that play so that's probably one thing i'll remember about him yeah absolutely um and then drew bugs the final senior uh he will be playing somewhere else next year um he we, he was a real question mark coming into the season we did not really know you know coming in the career assist leader at hawaii and absolutely like a pure point guard but actually had used a lot of possessions at hawaii a lot of shots um shot pretty okay from three-point range but actually put up a lot of shots in his time at hawaii to go along with all the assists and we knew we at least hoped that he would not be taking very many shots at missouri and he ended up taking very few and making very few unfortunately (laughs) yeah that was uh this is a weird one, and I and I I can't remember exactly what we said in the in the preseason like preview, but I can't imagine that we were expecting him to do too much, because I, I mean I feel like this is one of those Conzo things that just didn't really make a lot of sense at the time. Like, okay, we used up a scholarship on a point guard when we already have a two great guards, guards yeah. um, which now looking back and kind of seeing how apparently Conzo and Xavier Pinson didn't have a very good relationship, then maybe this makes a little bit more sense. Maybe he thought that it was possible Xavier could transfer. Maybe he knew that Xavier isn't very consistent and had some, would have some up and downs. Maybe he wanted to have somebody that could fill in if Xavier wasn't playing well. Well, one thing I think he knew for sure is that he didn't like Pinson's defense. Yeah. And so he brought in a guard that who's, who he knew would buy in on defense. Yeah. And he said as much multiple times throughout the season. Pretty much. So, yeah, Drew Bugs is a weird one. <clears throat> um, I think that – and maybe I said this last week or something when we talked about Bugs a little bit, but I feel like there was a little bit more in the tank as far as, like, what he could have done, but he just knew maybe that wasn't his role on the team. And so he really didn't shoot much. He didn't really do anything. Which game was it where he and Watson, like, went off in the first half, uh, like, carried them? I don't know, but that was that was a weird yeah, game. I'll see if I can find it. But well, we, I won't be able to find it unless I look it up. Was that – um? Arkansas the second matchup against Arkansas yes uh that sounds right I think that that was it where it was like okay where have these guys been and we yeah. would be so out of this game if it weren't for the two most unlikely players yeah I'm gonna find out here but yeah. I mean he had a nice looking stroke I felt like he I don't know I don't know if I would want him to shoot more maybe but because uh, there just wasn't a whole lot of extra usage to go around but I felt like he he could have done more yeah well what I said in the preview was that I thought maybe he would get the second most minutes as like the primary ball handler because I thought we'd be relying on Drew Smith and Pinson to score more. And I don't know. I don't think we really saw that. Drew Smith and Pinson were scoring by m- initiating the offense. Now, they both had some spot up jumpers, but I don't think not most of those were off of like inbound plays or like set plays out of a timeout or something it didn't seem like they really just let them be like the go-to scoring option unless they were initiating the offense out of a a ball screen um the lsu game he had eight points that might have been it so how many i felt like it was towards the end of the season Mm -hmm. like second half of the year and watson had nine and so, yeah, that's probably the game. Uh, 17 points in the first half. I think I remember seeing that stat, maybe 16 points in the first half. Yeah. And it was one that Missouri probably should. Nobody have else was doing anything yeah. and they, they couldn't quite get it done. All right. So um, I don't feel like we need to say much more about Penson. Uh, he's one of the juniors that we would talk about, but he's been so involved in every conversation that I think you get the point. I mean, just not quite consistent enough and the and the extreme inconsistency was just too much to overcome when he would when he was playing well he could carry the team to a win and then other nights he would just disappear 
and barely make the box score, even though he played 25 minutes. And he, at times, wasn't bringing it on defense to Conzo's liking and would find himself on the bench. And that's never helpful. I'm scared he's going to have an incredible season next year at LSU. But I mean, I could totally see him just getting in the right offensive system where the coach just lets him go to work yep. and lets him play 35 minutes a game. Because he, he wasn't fouling out of games. I mean, oh. he could play as many minutes as he wanted, and he's super athletic. And, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about that as well. But I hope he I hope he plays well at LSU, honestly. I mean, if the coaching staff can't make it work with a guy, then I don't necessarily – I mean, I like for the coaching staff to be making the right calls, but if it's not the right call, I'll be – happy to admit that they should have been able to make it work with Pence and I think they should have been able to but it wasn't meant to be okay so moving on to um, Torrance Watson uh, another player that has transferred out of the program now and he never could stick in the rotation Um, I think the most minutes he played were potentially his freshman year yeah Um, his best season by far was his freshman year he did have uh, – now, this is ending up being like a retrospective on like each of these players' entire careers because so many of them won't be back from Missouri. So And didn't play very much this season. Yeah, true. Um, for Torrance Watson, he I was present for his um, record-breaking performance in Mizzou Arena where he made eight three-pointers against Chicago State, and that was obviously the highlight of his career. <laughs> I recently – watched a highlight video of that game just like maybe like a week or two ago and i'm pretty sure they won like uh over 100 to like 30 something yeah they won by like 60 some like, points oh my gosh yeah. <laughs> chicago state is awful yeah I, I think it was like it was something like 91 to 31 it was like literally like 60 points yeah maybe it's 90 something i don't know it was yeah it was a ridiculous like point spread yeah um so watson showed that he could shoot it and then there was other nights where you thought how it, honestly most of the time i thought how is he missing he'd be open his shot looks so good and his his uh, most recent season this past season for missouri a lot of times it looked good and it would like rattle around or just be they they always looked good coming out of his hand and sometimes were just barely off it wasn't like he was bricking shots this past season he was just off a hair a lot of the time yeah i, I definitely wouldn't have been mad to see watson get 20 or 30 more opportunities at three-point shots this season like I he was honestly I still think that he was one of the best shooters on the team and I wouldn't have been mad if he took some minutes away from Mark Smith but that didn't really happen yeah he only attempted uh, Watson only attempted 31 threes this past season only played 15 percent of available minutes and obviously that that stat right there tells you why he it was looking to play elsewhere for his remaining eligibility all right, um, Javon Pickett, one of the players. And we'll, we'll go back to back with Javon Pickett and Kobe Brown here, two players that will be returning from this previous season. And uh, kind of opposite seasons for those two guys this past year. Uh, Javon Pickett was hurt a lot of the time. He had his big game against Illinois, but then other than that was kind of quiet but also quietly was one of the better three-point shooters on the team, but he only attempted 25 threes. So that's incredibly small sample size, but he was at 36%. If he can be a spot-up shooter with more volume, then that'd be great. But uh, he was limited by injury and just overall kind of, I don't know if statistically he regressed, but just from his contributions on offense particularly, I think he definitely regressed uh, at least for the second half of the season and most of that he was dealing with injuries yeah i think pickett's kind of a guy i forget about a little bit uh but i think he has a chance to surprise us a little bit next year uh i think he'll always have minutes on a Conzo martin team with just kind of a tough kid who plays good defense and plays hard all the time i definitely think uh as long as he's at mizzou he will have opportunities to see the floor in no matter how bad he's playing i think he'll always be out there but uh, yeah, I, I think he I think he is uh, underrated uh, skill wise. I think he he can shoot threes. 
he can uh, he can drive to the basket and, and create his own shot from time to time. Finish in transition. He, that was one thing he did really well. He would be like kind of at the the front end of the fast break and yeah. make layups in transition. Yeah, I, I definitely think that Pickett's a guy that uh, could average ten points a game um, next year. And I don't know exactly what his role is going to look like with all the new players. And that's kind of the fun of it is we just have no idea what's going to happen. But uh, yeah, wouldn't at all be surprised. And and with him being injured all year, I mean, it was just kind of almost kind of a lost season for him in a way. But uh, if he's healthy next year, I I absolutely wouldn't be surprised to see him average eight ten points a game. Yeah, uh, he had quite notably uh improvement in his offensive rating this year um it had hovered around 90 his first two seasons keep in mind 100 is average and he was uh at 104 by the end of this season um but because of injuries he only played 43 percent of available minutes after playing 62 and 67 percent um his freshman and sophomore seasons and uh that 36% from three, 40% in conference play. Again, on very small sample size. Um, one thing that I found interesting when I was looking at his Kim, Prom- Kim Palm profile was he was he took the 17th highest percentage of shots in the SEC his freshman season. I would not have thought that was. I true. remember being surprised, like how he kind of burst onto the scene. Uh, because obviously Torrance Watson was the guy that we had turned our attention yeah. to. He was the kind of the hot shot freshman coming in and the guy who was a big time scorer in high school from St. Louis. So we were just, I felt like we, he was really piqued our interest in that way, but. And Pickett was the opposite. Coming yeah. In. He we was knew like nothing about Pickett. Kind of, you know, uh, an afterthought for Illinois. They like weren't sad to see him go. Yeah. He had a prep year um, before coming to Missouri. And when he was in the starting lineup, we were like, whoa. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess this guy's better than we thought he was going to be. But he was fairly effective, um, but just not very efficient. Um, but his shooting percentages just jumped up this year. I mean, uh, 54% from two and 36% from three. On uh, Again, limited shots. But if he can do that over a full season with a higher volume, then we're easily looking at a double-digit scorer. Uh, Kobe Brown, I thought, kind of had the opposite season. He actually played some of his best basketball late in the season when the rest of the team was kind of imploding around him and he is but he's very similar to Pickett in that Conzo loves his game and he will be out there a lot of the time I honestly I thought maybe we should have gone bigger at times with a lineup where we played Kobe Brown at the three potentially like alongside Tillman and Mitchell Smith I I, there were different times throughout the season where I thought we could have utilized that lineup and that never really happened but obviously Kobe Brown's coming back I don't think we ever thought that he was at risk of transferring his brothers coming into the program Um, I think he will be a fixture in the lineup next season and that but I would like to see him get he, he starts a ton of games but he sometimes the sixth man on a given night will play 10 more minutes than him so I'd like to see him get more minutes and maybe he's still uh, maybe conditioning is still an issue for him but uh, I would hope not by the time he gets to his junior season that he can just really eat up minutes in the post yeah it's kind of unfortunate that the one really one of the first things I think of when I think of Kobe Brown and, and Javon Pickett is that they're both just kind of limited athletically they're both a little undersized uh, I can't imagine either one of them really being like huge difference makers but when and when I watch Kobe Brown especially uh, just it's kind of like how is he being how is he this good yeah. like at times you know he's just doesn't look super athletic he's not very bouncy he doesn't have, it's kind of got an ugly shot yeah a little undersized for his position but he just finds a way yeah. to to get things done and plays really hard he's really smart um he just he's physical but he yeah just i think finds he actually to, surprises me with how athletic he is because he doesn't necessarily look like he would jump out of the gym but he'll just finish a dunk yeah with ease and he, he can really drive to the basket pretty well and which is surprising when you see him do it you're kind of like oh okay good yeah. job yeah. so uh yeah i'm excited to see what kobe brown does um in his time at Mizzou. i think he uh is going to be a, a bright spot for the next couple of years so for his sophomore season this past year he was ninth in the sec in two-point field goal percentage and fourth in defensive rebounding percentage as well as 15th in offensive rebounding percentage so um, definitely the makings of 
a an all SEC type player down the line if he can uh, score a little bit more. And maybe he, he's got to improve either his free throw shooting or his three point shooting, preferably both. But this past season, he shot 25% from three and only 54% from the free throw line. He's got to improve both of those areas to get his efficiency up and just be more productive on the offensive end. Uh, let's see here. Anybody else in that class? Um, maybe technically Ed Chang, but uh, I did find it interesting. We were talking about in the season preview that Ed Chang, you know, if he can come in and, you know, can a couple threes a game, then he would definitely carve out a role in this offense and be a contributor. And we literally never saw him for a minute. Christian, I mean, Christian Guest played more minutes at Mizzou than Ed Chang. <laughs> So to Michael Porter Jr. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when you think about what Ed Chang's game was supposed to be, then, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, he was supposed to bring something to the table that we didn't really have, kind of a stretch four that could shoot. I mean, that sounds great. Maybe guard three positions. Yeah. yeah. But uh, for whatever reason, I don't – I never saw him in his jersey even. Like, I think he's just always wearing, like, a T-shirt on the bench. Yeah. Never took the warm-up off. <laughs> All right. So Parker Brown, another guy that is leaving Missouri. Uh, you, in particular, had high hopes for Parker Brown this uh, in the preview episode. Uh, you were talking about him potentially stealing minutes from Mitchell Smith um, due to his ability on the offensive end, and I think we still saw that potential in a, f- a handful of games this year, but apparently there was something missing on the defensive end. And, Very uh, much so. <laughs> yeah, he didn't get a whole lot of playing time, and now he has moved on. I still think Parker's best kind of stretch was not this past season, but the one before that, where he in conference play, I think we were playing maybe Ole Miss and that huge win against Auburn at home where they were really good, like a top 10 team a couple of years ago. Uh, he had a stretch where, you know, he was really filling the stat sheet and was, you know, scoring double digits and getting huge dunks and all this stuff. He was really looking exciting there for a little while, but uh, just couldn't stay, couldn't stay on the floor. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird situation where he, you know, was like a a preferred walk on coming in, coming to Columbia and then he got a scholarship, but just, I don't know. It seemed like it honestly seemed like the staff never really, was committed to him being uh, having a prominent role on the team like where was he ever going to fit in where was he ever going to carve out a role and did the staff really give him a shot there I mean I guess they were just seeing enough in practice and the limited minutes he did have but I mean it's kind of like the same thing with Watson like those two guys in particular it just seems like they never really got the run they needed to see if they could find their place on the offense or, you know, carve out their role with the team. Yeah. I mean, it just felt like Konza was so committed to kind of that top six or seven guys that nobody else really got a chance at minutes, even though everybody else kind of showed flashes, but, uh, you know, just kind of a big question mark that we talked about a lot was why is Mark Smith playing like 30 minutes a game? And just felt like Conte was really, really committed to certain guys that didn't feel like they necessarily needed to play as much as they as much as they did. But uh, I felt like Parker was definitely kind of the, uh, suffered from from some of those things where Conte was so locked into the guys ahead of him. Yeah. So uh, incredibly small sample size, but uh, so he actually appeared in 20 games this past season and had far and away the best offensive rating of anyone on the team at 130. One three zero, shot forty percent from three, four for ten, <laughs> but also seventy um, percent from two. Again, only sixteen for twenty three, but yeah, seventy percent from two. So yeah, that means an offensive rating way up there when you're that efficient from both areas. Um, so that's when you see that those kind of numbers with a small sample size, it just makes you want to see what could have been. But he will definitely get the opportunity to impress his new spot. That I mean, that got, that gets me thinking a little bit. Uh, I mean, I definitely think I could see Parker Brown, Torrance Watson, Xavier Pinson all be very success, very successful w- at their next stop. Mm-hmm. Like, what what does that say about 
Konzo or Mizzou or like is it just a better are they finding a better fit for who they are as a well, player? Well, part of that is the fact that two of them are going to Santa Clara and Elon. Sure. So if Torrance Watson was transferring to you know Texas Tech and Parker Brown was transferring to uh, Michigan, I would not think that they were going to have an expanded role and really you know unlock the next level of their game. Mm-hmm. Um, Henson could go to about any offensive-minded coach, and I would think that. Um, but the other two, they I think they honestly need that step down in competition to really show what they can do. Now, both of them potentially could just, like, blow up next year and then jump back into the Power Five, potentially. I don't think that's probably going to happen, but... Um, they could just be so like perfectly right on the line between just kind of not really seeing the floor for a power five conference for a power five team that's like top 25 ish level and then just like completely dominating a worse conference pull a jakeen and gant <laughs> yeah something like that maybe you know if they can and yeah he even went to i think a better program than either one of these guys so maybe they could have an opportunity to really dominate at a, a lower conference and then even maybe even jump back up to a higher mid-major type team now maybe they don't want to go to their third team in three years but we're seeing that uh more than ever especially this season so it, i wouldn't put it past either one of them to do that all right so correct me if i'm wrong but the last player we have to talk about is jordan wilmore jordan wilmore a lot to say uh barely saw the floor he uh, participated in five games, played 2% of the available minutes in those games, had an offensive rating of 78. He was two for four from the field, including an unfortunately horrendous miss dunk. <laughs> and that, I mean, that's just unfortunate. I mean, he, he's barely seeing the floor and then gets this wide open opportunity to dunk it, and he's yeah. just got to be completely nervous. It's like, it, it, honestly, it's like, reminds me of like fielding a punt or like catching a easy fly ball where you're just like there's no reason i shouldn't pull this <laughs> off and then just to like flub it is just yeah um there's really not very much you can tell from this season i i really do think that the plan was for him not to play a whole lot this season yeah, uh, or else like th- that would have been a bad sign for tillman or something probably but i don't know and what we did see from jordan wilmore uh man I don't want at all for this to come off like I'm, you know, like trashing him personally or anything, but I think I'm skeptical of him making a difference uh, at any point in his time at Mizzou. I hope I'm wrong. He just, like, he's very large. I mean, man, he can, I'm sure if he figures it out, like, he could be a great rebounder, defender, rim protector. Uh, I f- personally feel like in limited minutes, he looked just a little, just a step too slow. Um, doesn't really look like he could be a threat offensively but uh you know a lot can happen whenever guys are in the program for a couple years and all that stuff so who knows they got that strength and conditioning for multiple off seasons for sure so you never know what can happen i obviously hope i'm dramatically wrong but uh that's at least what i felt like i observed this season yeah i mean i can't say much to refute anything you just said i think obviously the role he has for the for his future at Mizzou is finishing at the rim, gobbling up every rebound that's near him, and blocking a lot of shots. So if he gets significant minutes, or just like if he's coming off the bench next season for like ten to fifteen minutes a game, we're gonna have to see a pretty high block rate. We're gonna have to see a pretty high defensive rebounding rate. And he doesn't really need to finish all that well at the rim. But, I mean, he doesn't have to have that many attempts. But he's got to be showing that he can do those three things. Two out of three is probably acceptable, you know, for his actual freshman season next year. But that's where he's expected to contribute. And I think with the makeup of the roster next year, with, you know, we still are hoping for a transfer big. Um, but with him and Yaya Kita holding down that five spot, Kita coming off of a ACL injury, not playing basketball in a year, more or less. Um, yeah, 
we're definitely hoping for a transfer and he's just gonna have to hit the ground running if uh, I mean all three of them whatever transfer we may get the freshman and Wilmore are gonna have to contribute to some extent next year I think I think Wilmore is really at the five I would have said he's more like a stretch four maybe yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe that maybe, yeah. like a, maybe like a point forward yeah I could see him yeah growing into that role probably yeah yeah yeah, that's a great yeah that's just great content there <laughs> um is that all the players we talked about every single one of them yeah we talked about a lot of players uh, unfortunately that was like that's it for like 80 percent of them yeah they're done at missouri it's still kind of crazy it's weird that none of those guys are coming back even the ones that are playing more basketball aren't coming back to missouri yeah, it's gonna be weird to see some of these guys in a different uniform yeah Seeing Mark Smith play for That's Kansas State is going to be so might weird. Might be the weirdest one. Yeah. So, uh, final thoughts on the 2020-2021 uh, season. Uh, the I, weirdest success yeah. of all time. Yeah. It feels like a disappointment, but it was also a success. Yeah. Just because of the way chronologically things fell, but when you look at what they accomplished individually, piece by piece, pretty impressive. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree. And somebody's listening to this and shaking their head saying that we're settling for mediocrity. But <laughs> to you, I, I say, rearrange the schedule in your mind. Go with me here. Rearrange the schedule. Distribute those late season losses to, you know, a little bit in the preseason or in the non-conference. Throw in another loss there, you know, like maybe we get swept by Tennessee on the season. Maybe we, we don't win the game against Alabama. We're like you know a fringe top 25 team all season on the bubble we don't know if we're going to make the ncaa tournament and we have a few fewer losses towards the end of the season and we don't know that we're a lock for the tournament we're because you know nine seed historically is kind of on the bubble but mizzou fans were being told for the last two months of the season there's no way you're not in the ncaa tournament so the floor was NCAA tournament so that just like completely retooled expectations for the season and if you just rearrange the schedule a little bit and distribute those losses earlier in the season then I think we're excited for selection Sunday and wondering where we're going to end up and getting that nine spot against Oklahoma seems a lot better I 100% think that, agree I think that just completely changes how people are viewing this season yeah, for some reason they played non-conference at the end of the season or something. We yeah. would be like freaking out about yeah. like how, wow, man, they just finished the season yeah. so well. They really figured it out. Yeah, yeah, they figured it out. So I, I don't know. I, I think it is a psychological a little bit just by the way things finished. But and that's we, one of the reasons I really wanted to look back at our preseason expectations because I thought, man, were we, were we talking about this team as like, you know, we weren't a, no at all. We didn't even mention the NCAA tournament in our preview episode. Because that was just kind of off the radar. I mean, we thought... That's wild. You know, we predicted... I said 13 and 11. You said 14 and 10. We both said 500 in conference play. We would not have anticipated that getting it done to get to the NCAA tournament because we thought, well, we didn't know the Oregon game was going to happen. And we couldn't count on beating Illinois and Tennessee and Alabama. Like, those were just... I don't know. I think, uh, I think if you... Do that exercise, rearrange the schedule a little bit. I think it makes more sense, and you can see it's easier to see the season as a success. For sure. All right, is that it? Is that it for this week? That's it. Man, we're we're getting closer to having to talk about football. I know. It, I mean, that's what I was just thinking was it feels weird that we probably won't really talk about these guys ever again, like yeah. consistently. They'll get a, they'll get a little uh, shout-out like, every once in a while but for the most part we're, we're done talking about this mizzou era of basketball of, of yep. mizzou basketball yep we're turning over a new leaf yep. starting next season dogecoin just hit 25 cents you're kidding me that's what we just found out yeah oh my gosh sign of the times oh my god <laughs> um that's all that's all i got for him though yeah all right everybody you can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Mizzou Sports Pod at, G- uh, at Mizzou Sports Pod. <laughs> you can email us at, <laughs> at Missouri Sports Pod at gmail.com. He's rattled. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, you can find our t-shirts and stickers on our online shop, MissouriSportsPod.BigCartel.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will see you next week. <laughs>